In this module, we'll be discussing beef. It's what's for dinner. The objectives for this module are identify the primal, subprimal, and fabricated cuts of beef, describe and perform basic butchery procedures, explain appropriate cooking methods for different cuts of beef, and apply appropriate cooking methods to several common cuts of beef. Beef is the meat of a domesticated cattle. Although Americans are consuming less beef today than we once did, we still consume far more beef than any other meat. As you can see from the survey from 2016, the United States consumed roughly about 25.9 kilograms per person. Beef's flavor stands up to almost any sauce or seasoning, which is one of the reasons why it's so popular. Beef is the third most widely consumed meat in the world, accounting for about 21% of meat production worldwide, after pork and poultry at 40 and 34% respectively. So let's discuss some of the bovine terminology. Cattle is a collective name for all domesticated oxen. Cattle are classified as follows. Steer, a male bovine or bull that has been castrated before reaching sexual maturity and is primarily used for beef. Cow, a female mature bovine that has given birth to at least one or two calves and is most often seen in the dairy industry. Heifer, a female bovine often immature but beyond the calf stage, less than one to two years of age that has never been calved. And bull is a mature intact testicles preserved and not removed, male bovine used to, for breeding purposes. It's a misconception that when we talk about beef, we talk about cow. In most cases, when we talk about beef, we're talking about steer. Some of the most common beef cattle that are used for the beef industry, the most common and the most popular these days is the Black Angus. It's the most common breed of cattle in the United States and in Canada and uh, most of South America. Carcass characteristics, uh, which are marketed as yielding, well-marbled, flavored beef. And it came to the U.S. in the 19th century and gained a footing in Kansas area and became very popular in Kansas due to the shipping and railroad hubs. With Charlaise, no other breed has impacted the North American beef industry so significantly. came to widespread use in the United States cattle industry at the time when producers were seeking larger framed, heavier cattle than the traditional British cattle breeds. Hereford, originating in England, Herefords became very popular in the United States for their early maturity and fattening ability. Dark red to red yellow in color with a white face. Herefords are known for their longevity and for being docile. The Texas Longhorn is an end product of survival of the fittest. It's an offshoot of the Spanish Andalusian brought by Spanish colonists and the native northern Central American cattle. Known for its characteristics horns, which ha can extend to over six feet across. In some of the more northern latitudes and some of the higher altitudes, you'll find the Highlands cattle. With long horns and a double coat, Highlands require little in the way of shelter, feed supplements, or expensive grains to achieve and maintain good condition and fitness. Cold weather and snow have little effect on them. Highland beef is meat that is lean, well-marbled, and flavorful, with little outside waste fat. Probably one of the most iconic cattle is the Holstein. While the black and white cattle are the most popular breed for dairy, Holsteins not used for breeding stock or milk production are raised for their value as beef cattle as well. Beef from Finnish Holsteins, finished steers have many desirable characteristics and provides a consistent product. Genetic similarities contribute to greatly to the consistency of the quality of the beef provided by Holsteins. So what is meant by the term primal cut? After the steer is slaughtered, the carcass is cut into four pieces called quarters for easily handling. 
This is done by first splitting the carcass down the backbone into two bilateral halves called sides of beef. Each half is divided into the forequarter or the front position and the hindquarter or the rear position by cutting along the natural curvature between the 12th and 13th ribs. The quartered carcass is then further reduced into primal cuts and subprimal and fabricated cuts. Boxed beef is an industry terminology for primal and subprimal cuts of beef that are vacuum sealed and packed into cardboard boxes for shipping from the packing plant to retailers and food service operations. You might have seen these in your local grocery store. Vacuum sealed steaks are very popular these days. Let's talk about fats. Marbling is the whitish streaks of inter and intramuscular fat causes meat to be juicy and tender. It's often said that fat is flavor. What they're actually referring to is fat is tenderness. So this marbling inside the meat or intermuscular inside the muscle or around the muscle intramuscular is what gives meat its sense of fattiness, its sense of satiety or fullness and its sense of richness. The more fat it has, the more higher it's graded. As far as grading is concerned, when we look at marbling, there are several different ways that we can look at it. Moderately abundant marbling is called prime, and slightly abundant marbling is called prime as well, although it's a slightly uh, lower grade of prime. A moderate marbling is high choice, and then a modest marbling is average choice and a small marbling is low choice. And then finally at the low end we have very little marbling. We would call that select. A good way to remember this is prime is obviously the number one. We always want prime. But if we can't get prime we'll choose choice. And if we can't get choice we'll get selected select. Another type of fat is called subcutaneous. Subcutaneous fat is exterior fat, the fat layer between the hide and the muscles. This is usually trimmed down to one quarter inch during butchering. This fat is also really good for rendering for tallow or beef fat. The forequarter consists of four primal cuts, the chuck, the brisket and shank, the rib, and the short plate. The forequarter represents approximately 55% of the carcass weight. the animal's shoulder. It accounts for approximately 28% of the carcass weight. It contains a portion of the backbone, five rib bones, and portions of the blade and arm bones. Because an animal consistently uses its shoulder muscles, chuck contains a high percentage of connective material and is quite tough. This cut of beef is, however, one of the most flavorful and least costly. The primal chuck is used less frequently than other primal cuts in food service operations. If cooked whole, the chuck is difficult to cut or carve because of the large number of bones and relatively small muscle groups that travel in different directions. When fabricating their own meats, chefs often purchase beef chuck as a chuck square cut, which is a two-piece cut. The smaller of the two pieces, both of which are shown here, is referred to as a shoulder clod or a shoulder. The primal chuck produces several fabricated cuts, cross rib pot roast, chuck rib shorts, cubed or tenderized steaks, stew meat and ground chuck used to make hamburgers, meatloaf and related items. Because chuck meat is less tender, these fabricated cuts usually benefit from moist heat cooking methods or combination cooking methods such as stewing and braising. There are exceptions, however. The beef industry is developing new products from affordable and underutilized cuts of meat. The shoulder top blade cut of the shoulder clod of the chuck can be cut into blade steaks known as flat iron. This cut is gaining popularity as an alternative and less costly steak suitable for dry cooking methods. The shoulder clod is a popular cut for traditional barbecue as well. The slow cooking of the barbecue method tenderizes the tough cut of meat.
The brisket and shank are located beneath the primal chuck of the front half of the carcass. Together they form a single primal that accounts for approximately 8% of the carcass weight. This primal consists of the steer's breast or brisket, which contains the ribs and breastbone, and the arm or foreshank, which contain the shank meat and bone. The rib and breastbone are always removed from the brisket before cooking. The boneless brisket is very tough and consists of substantial percentage of fat, both intramuscular and subcutaneous. It is well suited for moist heat and combination cooking methods such as simmering or braising. It's often pickled or corned to produce corned beef brisket or cured and peppered to make pastrami. Beef foreshanks are very flavorful and high in collagen. Because collagen converts to gelatin when cooking using moist heat, foreshanks are excellent for making soups and stocks. Ground shank meat is often used to help clarify or flavor consommes because it's high rich flavor and high collagen content. Marrow, the soft tissue in the center of the foreshanks, and hind shank bones is considered a delicacy when cooked and added to sauces or spread on toast. The hind shank is the animal's leg, and the term shank generally is used to refer to either the foreshank or the hind shank. The primal beef rib accounts for approximately 10% of the carcass weight. It consists of ribs 6 through 12 as well as a portion of the backbone. This primal is best known for yielding prime rib of beef. Prime rib is not named after the quality grade USDA prime, however. Rather, its name reflects the fact that it is constituted by the majority of the primal cut. The eye meat of the rib, or the center muscle portion, is not well exercised muscle and therefore is quite tender. The eye meat also contains large amounts of marbling compared to the rest of the carcass and produces rich, full flavored roasts and steaks. Rib roasts are available in a variety of styles. The oven ready, oven -ready rib roast contains rib bones, the short feather bones, and a thick layer of fat called the fat cap. The export style rib roast contains only rib bones and a thin layer of fat. The beef ribeye is boneless. The ribeye can be cut into boneless ribeye steaks. The rib bones are then separated from the ribeye meat and are quite meaty and flavorful and can be served as barbecued beef ribs. The end of the rib bones are that are trimmed off of the primal rib to produce the rib roast are known as beef short ribs. This is one of several sources of beef short ribs. Beef short ribs are also cut from the primal short plate, as discussed in the following section, as well as from the primal chuck. The short plate is located directly below the primal rib. It accounts for approximately 9% of the overall weight of the carcass. The short plate contains rib bones and cartilage that is the source of the short ribs and skirt steak. Beef short ribs are meaty yet high in connective tissue and are best when braised. Skirt steak, which is the animal's diaphragm muscle, is often marinated and grilled as fajitas. Other less meaty portions of the short plate are trimmed and ground for hamburger and related usages. The hindquarter consists of four primal cuts, the short loin, sirloin, flank, and round, and represent approximately 45% of the overall carcass weight. The primal short loin is the anterior or front portion of the beef loin. The short loin is located just behind the rib and the first primal cut of the hindquarter when the side of beef is divided into a forequarter and hindquarter. It accounts for approximately 8% of the carcass weight. The short loin contains a single rib the 13th rib, and a portion of the backbone. With careful butchering, the small primal can yield several subprimal and fabricated cuts, which are among the most tender, popular, and expensive cuts of beef. The short loin eye muscle, the, a combination of rib eye muscle, runs along the top of the T-shaped bone that forms the backbone. Beneath the loin eye muscle on the other side of the backbone is the tenderloin, the most tender cut of beef of all. 
When the short loin is cut in cross sections with the bone in, it produces, starting with the rib end of the short loin, club steaks, which are, do not contain any tenderloin. T-bone steaks, which contain only a small portion of the tenderloin, and porterhouse steaks, which are cut from the sirloin end of the short loin and contain a large portion of the tenderloin. The whole tenderloin can be removed and cut into the Chateaubriand, filet mignon, and tornadoes. A portion of the tenderloin is located in the sirloin portion of the loin. When the entire beef loin is divided into small primal short loin the primal and primal sirloin, the large end of the tenderloin, the butt tenderloin, is separated from the remainder of the tenderloin and remains in the sirloin itself. The smaller end of the tenderloin, or the short tenderloin, remains in the short loin. If the tenderloin is to be kept whole, it must be removed before the short loin and the sirloin are separated. The loin eye meat can be removed from the bones, producing a boneless strip loin, which is very tender and can be roasted or cut into boneless strip steaks often referred to as the New York Strip. The sirloin is located in the hindquarter, between the short loin and the round. It accounts for approximately 7% of the carcass weight and contains part of the backbone as well as a portion of the hip bone. The sirloin produces bone-in or boneless roasts such as the top sirloin butt and the bottom sirloin butt tri-tip, steaks that are flavorful and tender. With the exception of the tenderloin portion, however, the subprimals and fabricated cuts from the sirloin are not as tender as those from the strip loin. A portion of the tenderloin, called the butt tenderloin, is located in the sirloin portion of this loin. Cuts from the sirloin are cooked using dry heat cooking methods such as broiling, grilling, or roasting. The flank is located directly beneath the loin, posterior to or behind the short plate. The flank accounts for approximately 6% of the carcass weight. It contains no bones, although quite flavorful, it is less tender cut with a good deal of fat and connective tissue. Flank meat is usually trimmed and ground with the exception of the flank steak, which is often marinated, broiled, and sliced thinly to prepare a dish known as London broil. Primal round is very large, weighing as much as 100 pounds, or 45 kilos, and accounting for approximately 24% of the carcass weight. It is the hind leg of the animal and contains the round bone, H bone, shank bone, and tail bones. Meat from the round is flavorful, fairly tender, and reasonably priced. The round yields a wide variety of subprimal and fabricated cuts. The inside, also known as top round, the eye round, outside round, the outside round and the eye round together are called the bottom round, the knuckle and, hand, and hind shank with the leg bone. Steaks cut from the round are less tender, but because they have large muscles and are limited in their intermuscular fat, the top round and the the knuckle make good roast when cooked rare and sliced thin to preserve tenderness. The bottom round is the best when braised. The steamship round is a very large roast weighing as much as 70 pounds, and it comprises nearly the entire primal round. It's usually roasted whole and carved to order for special events and buffets. It's called a steamship round because of two distinct characteristics. One, when it's cooked, it looks like the chimney of an old steamship is sticking out from the meat itself, and that's the leg bone. The other one is, this was commonly used on steamships and cruise ships such as the HMS Titanic, and we all know how that ended. We've used the term fabricated cut several times, and we want to just touch on them and discuss what they are. These are individual portions of meat cut from the subprimals. So when we think about it, we go from the whole carcass to the um, half or split down the backbone to the quarters to the primals to the subprimals and then finally to the fabricated cuts. 
The fabricated cuts are what you would see on your plate when you send it out to a customer. These include things such as roasts, steaks, and chops. Here you can see some of the most popular steaks from the various different parts of the animal. For instance, starting on the, the top above the ribs, uh, the short loin gives us the T-bone steak and the porterhouse steak. And you can see where the tenderloin is located just north or just above the short loin. Going clockwise, the sirloin steak comes from the sirloin, which is above the tenderloin. The filet is from the tenderloin itself. The rump steak is from the round, or rump as it's called in England, and it gives us a more beefy but yet less tender steak. Speaking of beefy and less tender, the flank steak is located on the bottom end. And this steak is unique in that it has very long striations of muscles. And if you cut with the grain, you're going to be chewing all day long. But if you cut across those strands of muscles, I think you'll have a much more pleasant bite. The plate gives us the skirt steak, which is excellent for breakfast steaks and for fajitas. The brisket gives us the beef brisket, which if you're in Texas, that's the only barbecue. The flat iron comes from the chuck, and typically the chuck is used for ground beefs, but the flat iron steak, or culotte as it's sometimes referred, is a very popular restaurant cut these days. However, there is a vein of sinew that goes through it laterally, which means um, flatly across the inside of it. And if you don't cut this correctly, you can be chewing on this for days as well. The tomahawk and the ribeye steak are essentially the same steak. The difference is the ribeye steak is without the bone and the tomahawk steak is with the rib bone uh, still attached and it's called a tomahawk steak because it resembles a tomahawk uh, as far as a hatchet is concerned. Offals are not awful. They are actually used uh, in a variety of different uh, meats. Uh, they include things such as the heart, the kidney, the liver, the stomach lining or tripe, sweet breads, and the tongue, as well as uh, the oxtail and the trotters or forefeet. <laughs> Welcome to Steak 101. There are many different cuts of steak and I know it can be really confusing. So let me break it down for you. This right here is flank steak. On the cow, it's located in the belly area. On the underside here, because it's like a heavy working muscle, it's super, super flavorful. But it tends to be tougher and have less fat marbling running through it. It's best to marinate it and cook it over really high heat really quickly on both sides and make sure you cut it against the grain. Next, very popular, is also the sirloin. Now this is in front of the buttock of the cow. It's somewhat more marbled, you'll see. It's kind of like a medium working muscle. You wanna cook it over a medium, medium high heat. Personally, I like to eat it rare, medium rare at most. So some people will say the king in the steakhouse is the filet. The king of the filet is the Chateaubriand, which is the center cut of a long floating muscle that runs along the back of the cow. It doesn't have a super amount of flavor, but it is very lean and very, very tender. Now, when you're cooking a filet, you wanna make sure you season it well on all sides. A steak like this should take about eight minutes to cook, 12 minutes at most, depending on the doneness that you like. Strip loin is part of the loin muscle, which is somewhere near the ribs of the cow along the back. It has a nice fat cap here, so as it's cooking, it's kind of basting and adding a lot of flavor. Now for me, the perfect steak is the ribeye. And it has, as you can see, a good amount of marbling. That fat is gonna help in melting and flavoring all this meat. As they say, fat is flavor. And if you're looking for an economical version of this right here, I would say, go to your sirloin. Steak 101. Right, the guide to cooking a perfect steak, hot pan. The secret here is to make sure that we literally sear the steak and not boil it. Season it first, beautifully done. Get some nice large grains of pepper, so you've got a nice bit of heat. Mop up all that seasoning and sort of push in. The foremost important part is to make sure you take them out of the 
fridge 20 minutes before you actually start cooking them. Cooking a steak that's stone cold in the centre, you're going to have to overcook it on the outside. Pan's just started smoking. Touch the boil in, roll that round, and then just lay the steaks away, always away from you. And let the pan do the work. That's the kind of noise you want to hear in the pan every time. That nice sear. Again, pair of tongs, turn it over very carefully. Literally 30 seconds of the pan, you can see the colour. Beautiful. That layer of fat on the back of the sirloin, you want to render that down as well. That's it there. So, hit that into the pan. Use the pan to your advantage. Tilt the pan, let all that hot fat, olive oil run down the back, and it starts to sear the steak even better. Put a little bit of garlic in. That little flavour of the steaks. It doesn't need to be peeled, just lightly crush them in. That gives a really nice flavour to the steak. Turning every minute, so you've got that nice even colour. And if you're turning your steaks every minute, it starts to cook evenly. A little bit of thyme. It's really nice to get that nice fragrance. Just have time. A touch more. I quite like my steaks rare, so rare is here, opposite the palm, at the top. Medium is there, and well done is at the top of your wrist. And now, I'm going to start off with my butter. Little knobs of butter. And this is where the steak starts to take on a completely different flavour. Tilt the pan, and then just baste the steaks. That fried thyme, that garlic. Nothing's burning, and that's why we started off with olive oil. Get the garlic, you sort of brush the garlic over. Off with the gas, take them out, beautiful. Let them rest. And then from there, slice. Rare, going on to medium rare. Beef is a major source of protein. Beef is the primary food source of zinc, as well as vitamins B, uh, trace minerals, and other nutrients. As a matter of fact, the only non-occurring in nature vitamin B that you cannot get from any other source but meat, or in particular red meat, is vitamin B12, which is one of the reasons why as a vegetarian, if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, you have to take vitamin B12 supplements because you're not getting it at any other source. So here's a quiz question for you. What cut of meat is this? Beef tongue. That's right. This is part of the oval. And when roasted properly, yields one of the most beefy and flavorful of any of the roasts that you would ever have. It's very lean and it's very rich in uh, flavor because it is a very active muscle. So let's summarize and do some of the takeaways for today. Takeaway number one, beef is the third most popular meat in the world. Beef consumption in the United States is high, but not as high as in Uruguay and Argentina, South America, and in Japan. While its meat has many excellent qualities, Black Angus cattle is most popular in the United States thank to, thanks to an aggressive marketing campaign. Beef is broken down first into primals such as chuck, rib, and etc., and into subprimals like roasts and finally into retail cuts, which are smaller roasts, steaks, and chops. Most animal butchery is done through the process called seam butchery, where the butcher follows the seams or natural separations in between muscle groups. Offals are not awful. Some of the most flavorful cuts come from these varieties of meats. 